And uh, right now, I want to welcome uh, from the South Texas College of Law Assistant Professor Josh Blackman is with us. Professor, how are you, sir? Wonderful. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Uh, I thought your piece at the American Spectator was uh, was very interesting, particularly um, you know given what's happened not only in Santa Barbara but uh, over the weekend the uh, uh, shootings of uh, uh, two police officers uh, and apparently a, a concealed carry holder uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada. You write, is there really an epidemic of mass shootings? Because as you say, you you do a, a, an internet search uh, for mass shootings in, in common or mass shootings in epidemic, and you're going to get a ton of hits. You're going to get a ton of results. Well, that's right. The, the media would also suggest that mass shootings are common, they're happening more frequently, and they constitute a very large percentage of deaths by homicide. The inconvenient truth is that's not true. Um, mass shootings, which are defined as four or more murders in the same incident, are very rare, constitute a tiny sliver of gun homicides, and are not, in, are not happening any more frequently. Um, if you actually look at the numbers and drill down to them, um, as they do in the American Spectator piece, you'll find that these are extremely rare uh, uh, shootings that, that, that uh, just don't happen very often, yet they do attract a very large amount of attention in the media. You know, I mean, look, I think understandably, um, in in some regards, I mean, these are crimes that, again, they shock us. They they are out of the ordinary. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we are shocked by these crimes, because they don't happen uh, every day. So it's one thing for the media not, you know, uh, uh, not to downplay these stories or uh, overplay these stories. But uh, it's another thing for the media to suggest that there's something going on that isn't happening, when they suggest that there's an epidemic, that there's more of these occurring, um, that's simply false, you say. That's right. Uh, to give you a couple examples, um, on the sixth month of Sandy Hook, there were 46 people shot and killed in a 72-hour period in Chicago. And you didn't hear about a single one of those in the media. Um, I, did the, I did the numbers. In the first five months of June in Los Angeles, not too far from Isla Vista, there have been almost 200 homicides. You've not heard about any of them. The reason why this, these numbers are significant is that when you're discussing gun policy and various descriptions to make about this gun control or that gun control, the debate is often driven by these bizarre, rare, and tragic mass shootings when the overwhelming majority of these gun deaths have very little to do with mass shootings. So the actual focus of the entire legislative debate is often skewed in this matter. Um, all right. So I guess the next question is, you know, the Pew Research uh, did a survey, I think it was now back in uh, 2012, um, that showed most Americans are unaware that violent crimes actually been dropping uh, in this country for the past 20 years. You know, when you add that to this, again, false impression that uh, the media uh, uh, may want to give or tries to give that. Uh, these types of mass shootings are, are on the increase. Um, you know, look, I mean, Josh, what you're left with is an impression among uh, – it's a, it's a false impression that most Americans have about uh, their own personal safety and the, uh, the, the chances of something like this happening, um, you know, to them in their lives. Well, oh, Pam, that's absolutely true. Um, what you'll actually find – and I have a new article out with my co-author, Shelley Baird, in the Connecticut Law Review called The Shooting Cycle – what you actually find is that support for gun control, I'm sorry, support for stricter gun control in this country has been dropping over the last 30 years or so. And whenever there's a mass shooting, for example, Columbine or Newtown or whatever, there's this brief spike up of people who want to support uh, new gun control laws. But very soon after the shooting, that support fades. It's what's called regression to the mean. In fact, people go back to where they were before the shooting. In fact, even more so, it's the declining mean. In fact, after each mass shooting, there are fewer people who seem to want stricter gun control laws. So I think the American people, and perhaps they're, they, they've caught on to the fact that while the passions and emotions following these tragedies can be quite strong in the, in the immediate aftermath, it, this is not a sustainable basis to change our uh, 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 regulatory and our legislative framework for gun control. Now, and again, I think it's interesting you point out the American spectator, this doesn't mitigate uh, the uh, the conversation of the gun control debate. Uh, it's not that you're saying, well, see, we can't have a debate now or no reason to have a debate now. Uh, that's not what you're saying at all. But what you're saying is when you're having this debate, when you're having this discussion, when you're talking about what policies and what laws should look like, 
It needs to be based on the facts, on what's actually occurring. Exactly. No, the, the data about gun control should be based on the facts. And what are the largest causes of gun violence? I mean, the overwhelming majority of homicides are not with AR-15s or any kind of, any kind of rifle. They're with simple handguns. And they're, they're not in mass shootings in schools or movie theaters or shopping malls. They're, they're, they're in drug deals gone bad. They're in gang homicides. They're, they're, they're in various other forms of violence. So when you're trying to choose which legislative tools are used to stop gun deaths, aiming at high-capacity magazines or AR-15s is really only cut, uh, going at a tiny sliver of the unfortunate lives lost by, uh, lost by guns. And the, the entire debate is often premised on emotions and, and large misconceptions of what actually is going on. Talking with uh, Professor Josh Blackman from the South Texas College of Law. And, uh, you know, Professor, I, uh, it's interesting. You brought up this uh, a piece that you just did with your, uh, your co-author where you take a look at, at the attitudes, the, uh, the public attitudes, uh, and how they change after these uh, tragic events. Um, you know, it, it, again, if you read the, uh, the Talking Points Guide for the Anti-Gun Activists, uh, it's called effective, Reducing Gun Violence Through Effective Messaging. Uh, one of the things that they say is that, you know, ab right after an event like this happens, get out there if you're a gun control advocate. Get on TV. Uh, uh, you know, make your statements. Put out the press release. Be very vague about what policies. Uh, in fact, don't even really suggest a, po a certain policy or a specific policy, but just talk about the need for gun control. Um, and, you know, to a lot of people, Professor, maybe, to, maybe it's just me, but I think there are other Americans out there that feels kind of gross, uh, that in this time uh, where, when, again, we're still in that sort of zone of confusion, we don't know all the facts on the ground, you've got people who are out there uh, trying to take advantage of this, uh, you know, professionally, try to take advantage of this for their cause. Um, is, it, is it possible that, you know, one of the reasons why support goes down is that the American people just find that behavior to be gross? Well, I think what you see is on the on the anti-gun control movement, they have to strike all the iron hot, um, and, and they need to move quickly because if they look at the data, they realize that every single day that passes, the American appetite for various gun control reforms just decreases. I know President Obama, um, uh, uh, a few months after Newtown, said something to the effect of, uh, the notion that two or three months after something as terrific as Newtown happened, we, we moved on to other things. That's not who we are. That's not who we are. Um, we have sh Americans tend to have very short attention spans. And if the issue of gun control was not on the radar before the shooting, remember 2011, 2012, the person said not a thing about guns, why do we suddenly think that when there's, a few, uh, when there's this tragedy that all of a sudden all of our legislative priorities have to change? Um, the reason why that's a strike while the iron hot is because prior to this, there wasn't any movement for gun control. And eventually people go back to what they were doing before, and they say that was, that was very sad, and um, let's talk about other policy, other, other things that are on their minds. So, so there is this need to hit right away, um, but, but it's been, uh, at least on the federal level, largely unsuccessful. On the state level, in Colorado and otherwise, uh, New York, Connecticut, it has been much more successful. All right. Professor, again, I appreciate you coming on the program, sir. It's good talking to you, and I uh, hope that we can